Uh, there's Dr. Juan Cole, fresh off the bike. Okay, uh, I'm going to call an audible, Dan Frankenberger. We'll see you in a bit. We'll do the uh, community billboard uh, in uh, after Dr. Cole leaves us. Okay. Yep. Very good. Thank you. Dan Frankenberger in the newsroom. Well, this is uh, very special. Dr. Juan Cole joins us, I would assume, from Ann Arbor, Michigan. If you're not going to informed comment, uh, you're, you're not uh, you don't know what's going on in the world. And let us go now to uh, Queens University, where Professor Adnan Hussein is standing by to introduce our guest. Oh, hi, David. Um, I think our guest doesn't need too much introduction. He's been on the show before, but of course, people should know that he's a professor of history at University of Michigan and at uh, Ann Arbor. He's the author of numerous important books about uh, the Middle East, Islamic world, including uh, Muhammad, Prophet of Peace Amid the Clash of uh, Empires from 2018, and more recently, uh, translated uh, Persian poetry, the Rubaiyat, um, and is working on a study on uh, Omar Khayyam and his reception. So, um, but most people will know uh, him from Informed Comment, the blog he's been writing since 2002 that has become an indispensable service of news and commentary on the Middle East and on the world. Um, so we're delighted to have a chance to talk with uh, Dr. Juan Cole. Thanks, Juan, for coming today. Well, it's my pleasure. Well, you know, it was already about time, I thought, for a roundup on what's been happening uh, in the Middle East, um, you know, with the uh, Afghanistan pullout. Um, but things have accelerated in the last week or so, and it's really timely uh, to have you today since over the weekend, essentially, the Afghan government has fallen um, after a 10-day offensive that um, really encircled Kabul, took the major cities of Herat, Kandahar, Mazari Sharif. Um, the president, Ashraf Ghani, has fled the country. Um, and, um, you know, the entire situation has changed and everyone's wondering about how this could happen so quickly. Just last week, there were estimates that um, you know, the government could fall within 30 to 90 days, turned out to be about three. Um, and so we're here now. Um, and I think uh, one point to begin on is um, uh, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken was asked about these scenes of evacuating um, U.S. personnel um, and um, Afghan um, uh, Afghan citizens who had worked with, with U.S. US forces. forces. Um, um, and um, he was asked whether this reminded uh, uh, him of the scenes of U.S. evacuation from the embassy in Saigon in Vietnam. And he said, let's take a step back. This is manifestly not Saigon. And I wondered if we might start with your reaction to Secretary of State Blinken's characterization. Well, as with all historical analogies, uh, any analogy to Vietnam would be highly inexact, but both were wars that the United States lost. And uh, American exceptionalism makes it hard for us to say those words. I know I'm speaking partly to a Canadian audience, and, but you know all about the <laughs> United States exceptionalism. And uh, so it's it's hard for people to say those words. But the United States lost the war in Afghanistan, and it lost the war a long time ago. Uh, really, what's been happening is that enormous amounts of money and arms have been pumped into that place uh, to stand up a corpse. And uh, when when President Biden announced that the U.S. was leaving and that the money and the arms were going to dry up, so it's like one of those horror flicks where somebody who's, you know, should be a mummy and is walking around suddenly turns back into a mummy and turns to dust. Uh, so that's what happened to the government of Afghanistan. Yes, um, uh, I hadn't been following that closely any of the negotiations since uh, the uh, announced departure months and months ago. Uh, but it seems that in the intervening period, 
um, there weren't any successful attempts to broker some kind of political solution that would incorporate the Taliban into uh, the current government. Um, why did those fail? Were they really attempted or did the Taliban never really have any um, reason to uh, negotiate at all? I mean, obviously, you know, they have managed militarily to conquer, but it's happened fairly quickly in the last month or so. Before that time, there were months and months. Um, how do you assess what was happening in preparation uh, for the U.S. pullout? Well, you know, people people negotiate when when they have a weakness and they need to compromise. Neither the Kabul government of Ashraf Ghani nor the Taliban felt weak, and neither felt a need to compromise. Now, the Taliban did feel weak with regard to the United States, and did negotiate with Donald Trump's administration at Doha for a U.S. withdrawal. And what they gave Trump in the uh, lead up to the U.S. withdrawal, which Trump set on May 1st of 2021, uh, was that they uh, promised to refrain from attacking U.S. troops. So Afghanistan was off the front pages during the Trump administration because Trump more or less bribed the Taliban uh, to be quiet and not attack U.S. troops. They, they did go on attacking Afghanistan National Army sites, but they didn't attack, attack U.S. troops. And the quid pro quo was that Trump promised to get out and let the chips fall where they may. But the Taliban did not feel weak with regard to the central government of Afghanistan uh, and its army and police, because they knew that it was a paper tiger, that, that it had no reality behind it. And they were constantly in contact with those troops and security forces in the rural provinces. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were feeling them out. And they were saying, well, you know, what would it take for you to take off your white turban and put on a black turban and, 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 and join us? And uh, the, the troops would either indicate that, you know, they did have a price or they would indicate that they didn't, but uh, they were feeling them out and they felt a softness there. They felt a willingness. Uh, and Ashraf Ghani appears to have been unaware of this. He wasn't in touch with his own grassroots. Uh, and so when there were possibilities of him talking to the Taliban, he refused. Mm -hmm. Uh, so both the Taliban and the, the Afghani government bear some responsibility for refusing to talk. Right. Well, uh, this brings up a question now about, um, you know, how has the Taliban metamorphosed in the intervening years? I mean, we all remember, of course, uh, the time of Mullah Omar and, um, you know, they had this very strict ideological you know, brand of Islam, imposed it brutally. Um, you know, on uh, Afghan population, uh, there are, seems to be some signs of possible pragmatism in their approach now, or I wonder if there really are. Um, it also used to be almost exclusively uh, sort of Pashtun, uh, ethnic, uh, ethno-religious movement, um, but now seems possibly to broaden its base or at least be able to incorporate groups from other ethnic uh, communities more readily. I'm wondering what you make of the Taliban, what kind of a movement it is now, and um, what kind of approach to governance might they uh, take if there are signs that you've been reading? Um, yeah, so uh, and I think it's still largely a push to movement. Hmm. And I don't think, I don't think very many push tunes are invested in it. But those who are are very invested in it. Uh, and I don't think it has much appeal uh, to the Tajik Persian-speaking Sunnis north of Kabul, uh, who held out against the Taliban in the 90s. Uh, I don't think it has appeal in Herat, uh, where people are also speak a, a dialect of, of Persian. Uh, it doesn't have appeal in the north, where there are Uzbeks. Uh, and it is roundly despised and hated by the Shia Afghans, uh, the Hazara, uh, who 
speak Persian and are Shiite of the sort that you have in Iran uh, and who were massacred by the Taliban in the late 90s. In fact, Iran almost went to war with the Taliban over and over. Uh, their massacre of, of Iranian diplomats in Mazar-e Sharif in 1998. Uh, so I don't think the movement is broadly based. Uh, it's 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 got a narrow constituency, but it has the esprit de corps. It has guns. I think it probably has money from somewhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, we can speculate from where exactly, but somebody's sending money. Uh, Would it be and, Saudi Arabia? They are Sunni. Or they right? say in the in the Middle East, Allahu Alam, God knows best. Uh, I, I don't, you know, I don't have a security clearance, and I don't. I'm not a hacker, so I, I can't trace the money going to the Taliban. In fact, they probably use the old Hawala system, so you couldn't. It's not electronic uh, transfer, so you probably couldn't trace it anyway. Uh, but it is rumored uh, that uh, the Pakistani military uh, supports them. I do not know uh, if that's true or to what extent. Uh, And you have to remember, there are a lot of um, millionaires and billionaires in the oil gulf, uh, many of whom have an ideology that uh, is supportive of the Taliban. And individuals can send a lot of money. And this happened with ISIL in Syria and northern Iraq. Uh, three Kuwaiti businessmen were indicted for giving money to ISIL. Uh, so um, I, I'm not in a position to specify, but I, I, I mean, it seems clear to me that they have more money than they ought to. Uh, mm-hmm. they, they're from these rural Afghan provinces, which are poor as, as dirt. Uh, and uh, uh, how, how do they pay 70,000 fighters and uh, buy weapons and and and, and 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 bribe police to come over to their side and so forth. Uh, But I don't think the money is the important thing. Uh, The important thing is that they're united, that they have a a strong esprit de corps, a strong ideology. And they had some advantages uh, with regard to the rest of the Afghans. Uh, They portrayed themselves as fighting an American occupation of the country. And again, I think it's really hard for Americans to think about themselves as having militarily occupied Afghanistan. Why they have trouble understanding that, I couldn't tell you, but it's it's not a discourse that we hear in our media. Uh, and uh, it is, however, very much how not only the Taliban, but a lot of Afghans saw it. I guess so. I wasn't sort of thinking that they had actually broadened, but I wondered if there was some pragmatism in order to achieve international recognition of the government, whether they might moderate some of the worst excesses that we remember from the late 90s, for example, like the massacre of the Hazaras. If they don't want Iran to take up or sponsor some kind of counterinsurgency to the Taliban, control, they might have to, uh, you know, accept that there are, uh, you know, ethnic and religious differences in in the country. And I noticed that uh, there are some statements uh, from China, from Russia, um, even from Iran, suggesting that uh, there might be the possibility to work with the Taliban. In fact, actually, even you know, the U.S. government has just said, Biden has said something uh, to the effect of that if they recognize people's basic rights, um, you know, and don't sponsor terrorism and allow terrorism to take root, uh, terrorist organizations to have a haven, that it may be possible to work with them. So I'm wondering, what are they seeing? Is it just merely they have no other alternative or choice or are the Taliban themselves making overtures that suggest that they're prepared to do business um, and recognize, um, you know, what it might take to re- receive some kind of legitimacy for for their conquest, essentially, of the country. Yeah. Well, you you may well be right, Adnan, <laughs> that uh, uh, that that there may be more pragmatism this time around. Um, a, a thing to emphasize is that the word Taliban has by now become fairly meaningless. 
Uh, you and I remember the old Taliban, uh, and that's what they're called, just the old Taliban of Mullah Omar, uh, who were uh, largely formed in those Pakistani seminaries, the madrasas, which were Deobandi madrasas. They, they followed a school of Indian uh, Islam, which had an enormous emphasis on uh, minute obedience to the uh, tiny details of uh, the uh, sayings and doings of the prophet and the companions. Uh, and they had these enormous, the Deobandis had these enormous uh, collections of hadiths or sayings and doings of the prophet and the early community and accepted many of those as legitimate that mainstream Sunni Islam has tended to view as weak. Uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, Comparative religions-wise, it's, it's, it's sort of like very, very orthodox Jews, so the, uh, the Haridim uh, and the Talmud. And um, that was the school in which they were brought up. And of course, the Saudis had given money to those madrasas. And so they were inflect, inflected with the Saudi hardline Mojave ideology, which is somewhat different from the Deobandi, but they kind of melded the two uh, in those seminaries. And uh, they formed an old school tie. They, they had an esprit de corps as like they'd all voted for the same soccer teams. And uh, uh, they've, it, it just, the Pakistani constabulary discovered that they could be deployed uh, against uh, the robber barons who had grown up on, on the Afghan-Pakistan border. And so they gradually evolved into a military force. Mm -hmm. uh, the people who call themselves Taliban today, clearly, most often, the younger generation did not come up through those seminaries. Uh, and uh, and so are they really Taliban? Because Talib mean, means seminarian. Uh, they, they adopted a kind of outlook of the old Taliban. And then there are groups that joined in once the Americans uh, invaded Afghanistan. Yeah. Uh, so uh, that so you they have... I'm sorry. Uh, you have the uh, the Hizb -e Islami or the Islamic Party of Golbadin Hikmet Yar, who was America's prime ally against the Soviets in the 1980s, but who turned on the United States once it came into Afghanistan in, in, in 2001, and joined the Taliban. So the Hizb -e Islami people are often now called Taliban, but they're not. I mean, they never had any. They they were never in Pakistan, and they were never in those seminaries, and and they're just. Eastern Afghan Pashtuns uh, with a Muslim Brotherhood kind of outlook. Uh, and uh, uh, then uh, the Haqqani group uh, joined uh, the Taliban, and the Haqqanis were, again, uh, Jalal al-Din Haqqani had been an ally of the United States against the Soviets who turned on the U.S. Uh, in 2001 and after, and who were based in uh, the federally administrated tribal areas of Pakistan in, uh, in, in North Waziristan, uh, and they are extremely now anti-American, uh, and they are often called Taliban, but again, they've never had anything to do with seminaries, or, or, and they're not actually what, what, what might, one might think of as Taliban. Uh, and then there's a new generation of people calling themselves Taliban. There are tribal groups like the Mahsud in Northern Pakistan who declared themselves Taliban just because they like the ideology, although I think most of them have never been anywhere near a school. So um, uh, there's a lot of groups here that were lumping under that rubric of Taliban. And uh, it's not clear who's gonna come out on top. Uh, Golbadin Hikmet Yar, for instance, has announced that he's gonna try to negotiate a, a transitional government with the current Taliban leadership and put himself in it. Uh, so he seems like not to be in the inner circle anymore uh, and is having to plead to be let in uh, to the new government. Right. Well, um, I guess looking forward, you had a piece in Informed Comment that talked about the winners and losers, uh, you know, in this situation. And I'm wondering if maybe you could give us a little bit of a rundown of what you think the main consequences of the Taliban takeover will be geopolitically. Um, especially since there could be a risk of 
um, regional powers, other groups contend contending for influence within Afghanistan now that the U.S. has 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 pulled out. Sure. Uh, well, I argue that Iran is is actually all of these countries are winners and losers. But uh, Iran is a winner to this extent that the U.S. military is no longer surrounding it. Uh, back in the zeros, the U.S. had 130,000 troops in Iraq. They had uh, nearly 100,000 in Afghanistan. The Iranians were in a vice. Uh, the U.S. has applied severe economic pressure to Iran. Uh, and so now there are no U.S. bases uh, near Iran, and th th there are only 2,000 U.S. troops left in Iraq, uh, and, and those are trainers. So uh, I think the Iranian leadership is breathing easier uh, after this has happened. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Iran can suffer some negative consequences from the rise of the Taliban. A hardline hyper Sunni group that hates Shiites, not a pleasant uh, uh, neighbor for Shiite Iran and its Ayatollahs. Uh, there's, going, there's already a big refugee rush into Iran from Western Afghanistan which the Iranians are allowing. Um, Iran has a labor shortage and, and, and the Afghans kind of help to fill it. So the Iranians don't really mind, I think, letting them in, uh, but that's a burden on society. Uh, and uh, uh, so there's, there's danger of hostilities uh, with the, the Taliban on Iran's part. There's danger of Taliban attacks on Afghan Shiites, which would put the Iranians in a difficult position as you, as you said, and not. Uh, and um, and then uh, the Taliban weren't usually very good about cracking down on the poppy trade, uh, and that could see a big in, uh, resurgence. Uh, there are a lot of addicts uh, uh, to heroin in Iran, Pakistan, uh, Russia, uh, and that problem could resurge and, and grow. Um, Pakistan is a winner. Uh, they have good relations diplomatically with the Taliban. They may be backing them behind the scenes. Uh, the Taliban delegation is coming to Islamabad. Pakistan will recognize the new government. And uh, from Pakistan's point of view, or from the point of view of the Pakistani military and political elite, uh, they were not happy with the Ashraf Ghani government and its predecessors. They saw those Kabul governments that the U.S. had installed as pro-India. Yeah, and, yeah. and Pakistan has severe conflicts with India. It has a long border with India. India is a much larger uh, country with more allies. So Pakistan felt, you know, if you have a pro-India government in Kabul and then you have India on the other side, that is kind of squeezed and uh, uh, insecure. So Islamabad, I think, is pretty happy about these developments, even though, again, they may face a big refugee uh, influx and they they did take in three million refugees during the 1980s Soviet war. Uh, about half of those families had gone back in recent years, but they could come right back, and that's a big burden on Pakistan's economy. Uh, and uh, and again, the, the drug problems are there, of uh, trafficking and so forth. Um, I would argue that. Uh, Russia is a beneficiary of this in the sense that Uzbekistan and Tajikistan, uh, the immediate neighbors uh, of Iran, of, of Afghanistan that are former Soviet socialist republics, are terrified of the Taliban. Uh, their post-Soviet elites are secular-minded people and don't like political Islam at all. Mm -hmm. They're afraid of Taliban influence in their countries. Uh, the last time the Taliban came to power, the uh, uh, Uzbekistan closed the only bridge. The friendship bridge between the two countries was closed. There was no friendship. Uh, and um, uh, people are fleeing across that bridge from Mazar. In fact, the apparently a good deal of the Afghanistan army fled across the bridge into Uz Uzbekistan. So uh, the Russians are telling the Uzbeks and the Tajiks, uh, uh, never fear, Moscow is here. Uh, and offering them more Russian troops, more Russian bases uh, to protect them from the Taliban. And ordinarily, you know, the Uzbeks and the Tajiks finally got uh, free of the Soviet Union. Uh, they might not be so eager uh, for a big uh, Russian military presence, but under these circumstances, 
they might be welcoming it. So uh, Putin could well reassert himself in Central Asia. Uh, so some of the, those are some of the winners and losers here. What about China? I mean, I think they've been among the first governments to say that it's possible to work with the Taliban, and obviously they have some strategic relationship with Pakistan and rivalry with India. So they also seem to have had an interest in a pro-Pakistan um, government in Afghanistan simply because of their close relations with with Pakistan. Yeah, um, I think China, first of all, wants stability. Uh, it's like 19th century Britain. It's a status quo power now. And it has these big plans for uh, building out the infrastructure of transportation and trade in Central Asia. Mm -hmm. And the instability in Afghanistan was a, a drawback for these Chinese plans. So I think it could go either way. If the Taliban advent in Afghanistan provokes more instability, then it will be uh, an obstacle to the One Belt, One, one Road plans uh, that, that China has. If, on the other hand, the, uh, the Taliban are able to make the trains run on time, uh, uh, there, there aren't any trains, I don't think, but uh, uh, some may be created, uh, then, uh, uh, then China would be happy enough with that situation. The Chinese don't like successful democracies, the Chinese government. Uh, they, they keep wanting to say that it's not a universal model that the United States puts forward or that NATO puts forward. Uh, and so I think uh, uh, any time a democratic government falls, as just happened in Afghanistan, to the extent that the any government was elected, which it was, and there was an elected parliament, other uh, Chinese uh, take a certain amount of uh, satisfaction in that. On the other hand, the Chinese are uh, really afraid of political Islam. And uh, they, of course, have been rounding up uh -huh. uh, and re-educating their own Muslims, uh, the Uyghurs of the of the uh, Northwest, um, sending in Chinese settlers amongst them, diluting their political power, uh, uh, rounding up large numbers of them apparently uh, to re-educate them. Uh, and some Uyghurs had gone to fight with the Taliban. I mean, there are Uyghurs among the Taliban. So that's not going to make Beijing very happy. And the possibility of a Taliban blowback on Xinjiang, on the northwest uh, part of China, has to be in Beijing's mind. Right. Um, you mentioned the problem of refugees. Um, already, of course, there are three million or so that had come to uh, Pakistan, some, as you pointed out, returned. There also were millions um, in uh, Iran, and there could be uh, even more. Um, but um, Turkey has made some interesting uh, pronouncements about the need to stabilize the situation to prevent refugees from coming into Turkey via Iran. And it seems that uh, Erdogan is... Um, in mini me style, uh, building a wall uh, along the border to prevent refugees coming from, well, to prevent people coming from Iran into into Turkey. Um, but they've also been suggesting that they want to stay, unlike uh, many of the other NATO gov NATO uh, governments. They haven't pulled out their uh, diplomatic personnel. They've maintained their troop presence and are. Uh, claiming that they would like to negotiate uh, a way for them to stay and control or protect the airport. I'm wondering what you think of this um, kind of overture. What is uh, Turkey's interest in this? Um, and why, um, perhaps you can explain why it seems so fundamental to control uh, the airport once you have evacu the evacuations, you know, taking place, you know, in the next several weeks, if all the U.S. troops and all the European uh, diplomatic uh, missions and so on are out uh, of Afghanistan, what's at stake really in control uh, over the airport? Yeah, well, Turkey has a longstanding Central Asia policy. Um, I don't think anybody's very invested in pan-Turkism anymore, but, you know, the Uzbeks and the um, Kazakhs, uh, the Turkmen do speak Turkic languages. 
They're about 50% mutually comprehensible with uh, Istanbuli Turkish. Uh, and uh, Turkey has tried to uh, parlay that linguistic similarity into trade relations and diplomatic relations uh, without tremendous success. But it's, it's one of the features of the uh, Justice and Development Party that has been ruling Turkey uh, since the uh, since about 2002, uh, that it, it's very invested in expanding Turkey's foreign trade. Uh, and uh, Central Asia with uh, gold and oil and cotton and so forth is, is uh, an area that the, the Turks have their eye on. So I think, you know, their Afghan policy is an extension of their Central Asia policy. They'd like and there are Uzbek uh, Turkic speak, speak, speakers, about 10% of, of Afghanistan is Turkic speakers. Uh, so um, I, I think probably they want to keep the airport open uh, 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 partially so that Afghanistan doesn't become isolated from uh, world trade and, and, and world relations. They would, they would like to keep the country available for these investment projects and so forth. Uh, and uh, and have Turkey play Big Brother to some extent, uh, which it's very happy to play in, in a number of countries. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's that's part of what's driving all this. Uh, the other issue is the refugee problem. Turkey uh, uh, suffered enormously from the Syrian civil war, and has taken in oh, oh. I think they oh. say three and a half million uh, uh, Syrians. Uh, and um, a lot of Turks are done out about this because they do take service resources. On the other hand, Turkey again uh, had a labor shortage uh, compared to the potentiality of the growth of its economy, uh, and the Syrians have filled it. So there's a lot of small businesses, a lot of farms uh, that suddenly could expand uh, that couldn't before because now they have uh, Syrian labor. Uh, uh, but it's been a controversial subject in Turkey. Uh, those three and a half million people for a country of 82 million, this is this is big, uh, or it might be 85 now. Uh, and um, then large numbers of Pakistanis, Afghans, Syrians, and so forth used Turkey as a transit into Europe, which in 19 in 2015 2016 caused a, a, a crisis in Europe. Uh, Turkey pledged to Europe that it would crack down on those flows, the refugee flows, uh, if it were given the resources by Europe to do so. So basically Erdogan shook, shook down the European Union for about $3 billion a year. Uh, I think he has to be a little bit afraid if, if, if hundreds of thousands of Afghans show up in Berlin uh, through Turkey that uh, the European unions will cut off the 3 billion. Uh, and then some of them may stay in Turkey, adding on to the Syrians and, 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 and cause him political domestic problems. Yeah. Well, I guess we should come to the U.S. So domestically speaking, I mean, what do you think are the real implications or how do you think uh, Biden has been handling uh, the sort of quick collapse of the Kabul government? Um, you know, it seems like many on um, in the Republican Party are trying to uh, pin, you know, all of the ignominy upon Biden and his policy. As you pointed out, uh, the roots of this were deep and far back in history. This has been a failed war for a really long time. And, you know, Trump policy, this is really in some ways the fulfillment of the Trump uh, policy to remove the U.S. from active military involvement and propping up the government. But how do you think he's been uh, handling and what do you think are the domestic uh, consequences and how might this fit into uh, uh, Biden's policy in, in the region in general and other kind of continuing conflicts that the U.S. is involved in? Well, this is very personal for Joe Biden, as I read him. Um, Biden uh, was an advocate as vice president uh, way back in 2009 for uh, abandoning the Bush administration projects of nation building in Iraq and Afghanistan. And Biden negotiated the US withdrawal from Iraq in 2011 and uh, he, he felt that 
Uh, the issue for the United States in the Middle East, aside from Israel and oil, uh, was security. And the security issue was a terrorism issue. And what you do about that is if you have a terrorist cell, you hit it. And Biden has been around the block. You know, he was chair of the powerful uh, Senate Select Committee on Foreign Affairs for many, many years. And he was a minority uh, leader when, when he wasn't chair. Uh, and uh, he's been to most of the countries in the world. He knows the world very well. He knows that 99.9% .9 of people in the Muslim world are not terrorists and, and don't hate the United States, uh, that, that, that the terrorists are a fringe. So his argument has been, and this is uh, 20 years he's been making this argument, that, that it's wrong to misuse American resources to occupy countries and try to build up governments and uh, reshape the world and, and, and play master of the universe. It is very expensive and, and, and costly in treasure, but also in US military lives. When you know, you're using the wrong tool for the wrong project. If, 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 if terrorism is the nail, then you use the hammer of, of counter-terrorism. Uh, and uh, he, he clearly was at odds with the Pentagon, where you had these big think uh, generals like uh, General David Petraeus and Stanley McChrystal, who wanted to do what they called counterinsurgency. And their idea of counterinsurgency very much was a matter of nation building. Uh, a lot of counterinsurgency thinking uh, goes back to the British uh, uh, campaign against the communists in, in colonial Malaya, what, what later became Malaysia uh, without Singapore. Um, and uh, uh, the British uh, had a problem in the 1940s and 50s with, uh, with communism in Malaya, and uh, they rejiggered their colonial apparatus and they used their military in Malaya to put down the communists. Uh, and uh, it's been pointed out, and, and people kept referring to the Malayan model uh, during the Vietnam War, for instance, and that this is, runs deep in the US military intellectual history, uh, but it's a, it's, a, it's a wrong model. It's completely inappropriate. Uh, th there are many things to say. I was once on the radio with John Mearsheimer, the realist uh, thinker mm -hmm. from Chicago, and Max Boot brought up Malaya. And, uh, and and John was was it was it was so funny it was deadly. John looked at, John John looked at, at Max Boot. He said, "Max, the British aren't in Malaysia anymore." <laughs> it wasn't that successful. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, but but the other thing to say is that the British had been in Malaya since the 1850s. Uh, they went there for for tin and rubber, and uh, th they knew. Their administrators knew local languages. They had uh, been there for for decades and, and knew local leaders. And communism didn't have a, an appeal to the majority or the or the or the uh, the fifty percent of the of the population that is ethnic Malay. It was only the uh, sum of the Chinese Malays who uh, went communist. So the British just rounded them up and isolated them. Yeah. They put them they put in communities and things. And you you, you know. Afghanistan is not like Malaya, and the United States didn't know Pushtu, and it, it didn't know the people, it didn't know the names of the tribes. It, it, it couldn't have done in Afghanistan what the British did in Malaya, uh, and Talibanism obviously is much more popular than than communism was in Malaya. So, um, but I'm arguing that Petraeus and these uh, big think uh, military thinkers had that model of nation building, of doing, of of, of colonizing Afghanistan. And uh, Barack Obama, when he came into office, uh, was, we forget, you know, was very young and naive. He really didn't know the world. And uh, he, he went to the Pentagon and said, well, I want a withdrawal plan. Uh, in fact, I want three plans. I want a, a minimalist plan where we just, you know, what would happen if we got right back out? Uh, I want a medium plan. If, if we have to do something to stay in for a while, I want a, a, a big plan if, if we're going to have to do something major there. So the Pentagon said, yes, sir. And then nothing happened. 
and and Obama didn't hear from them. And you know, Washington's very catty. So by fall of 2009, there were op-eds in the Washington Post that what's what's Obama's Afghanistan policy? Does he know what he's doing? He's dithering here. So he goes back to the Pentagon and and says, uh, well, where are the three plans? And they said, well, uh, I'm paraphrasing, obviously, but they said, uh, Mr. Obama, we've just really been able to do the one big plan. We don't have the minimalist one for you. Uh, but the big plan would be to do a counterinsurgency. Uh, so you give us extra 100,000 troops and we'll take care of the country for you. And so Obama fell for it. Uh, I don't know if he felt he had little choice but to do something. Uh, of course, everybody was afraid all along that if you just pulled up stakes, uh, I think this goes back to Bush, that what what would happen in Afghanistan is what, what just happened. So he didn't want to do that. Uh, so he he let Petraeus and McChrystal run wild in Afghanistan, gave them all these uh, billions of dollars, and uh, and they did what they call counterinsurgency. But McChrystal actually at one point said, we're going to bring down a, a, a government in a box from Kabul down to some of these provinces that uh, the Taliban were in. We'll chase out the Taliban. We'll, we'll establish security. We'll establish good relations with the locals. And we'll bring down a government in a box from Kabul. I mean, I mean, McChrystal revealed himself not to be the brightest bulb in the chandelier later on uh, when he mocked Biden and uh, to the Rolling Stone uh, and um, got himself fired. But uh, that he thought that there was a government in Kabul for Kabul was a sign of how clueless he was, much less that expertise was in Kabul that could be brought down to Pushtun areas in Helmand province. So um, uh, I don't mean to be glib, but I would I, I think it's fair to say that this counterinsurgency project, uh, which involved uh, nation building, was was an enormous failure. And Biden didn't want it. He, he told Obama, don't do that. And uh, he fought against it. I, I do some consulting in D.C., so I used to hear from the congressman that, that Biden was unhappy. Uh, and uh, when he became president, he finally had a an opportunity to say no, no more nation building, no more counterinsurgency. If there's a terrorism problem, and you know, if, if Qaeda cell grows up in 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 Logar province in Afghanistan, by God, we'll send in special ops guys, and we'll send in drones, and we'll kill them. But we don't need to spend trillions of dollars on occupying this country. Yeah, it seems that he's. Um been rather direct in saying um, that, you know, if uh, Afghan military won't fight for the country, why should we? Um, so we have to actually take a much more realistic approach. Um, and um, we'll see if that politically, um, you know, uh, pres you know prefer preserves his, uh, you know, uh, congressional majority and, and so on in the upcoming midterms. But um, it seems like there's an attempt to try and uh, uh, pin, you know, the failure of Afghanistan on him. So I think it's an interesting political move uh, on his part to simply own it and say that it doesn't, um, you know, there's there's no reason to be staying staying in, in, in there and that this, this collapse of this government proves that it was, uh, a failed policy that you can't continue to 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 prosecute. Um, so we'll see. That's. Um, I wondered also if we have a bit of time. I wondered if uh, for a few minutes we might look beyond Afghanistan and to other parts of the uh, Middle Can East. I ask just a quick question. Yeah, go ahead. So this is so fascinating. I'm a little confused. Uh, thank you for coming on the show again, Doctor Colin. Thank you, Professor Hussein. What is the Taliban offering the country of Afghanistan? There, there are about a thirty some some odd million people. Are they winning the hearts and minds of this eclectic group? I mean, I was reading you over the weekend. It, it's a demographic nightmare. It's so split. Nobody speaks the same language. What are the? What does the Taliban offer other than fear? Is what. George W. Bush would say, but what do they offer the people of Afghanistan? Yeah. Well, for the people who might be won over by them, uh, they offer national independence 
pride in country, pride in self, standing tall, no longer occupied by foreign Christians. Uh, and um, I think if you don't know Afghans, uh, it, 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 it may be hard to understand, but they're very, very proud people. And they were humiliated. If you're a Pashtun, are you proud of being a Pashtun and being a part of Afghanistan? Or is it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, actually, the, the word Afghan probably means Pashtun. OK. Uh, and uh, uh, the Pashtuns are the backbone of the country. They're very proud Afghans. Uh, there, are, there isn't really much in the way of a separatist movement uh, among any of the ethnic groups in Afghanistan so far. Uh, and the, what do the Taliban want other than foreign intervention to disappear? What are they? Can they govern? Have they shown that they can govern? Can they say, can they collect the garbage? And what 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 does their government look like twenty you know twenty years from now? What what do they anticipate? Yeah, I, I mean, those are good questions. I, I think uh, we don't know the answer to many of them. Uh, they, they, they weren't very good at, at collecting the garbage in the 90s. Uh, I can say that. But then they were wet behind the years and they were these young seminary students who'd never had to organize anything. Whether they've learned something while they've been in the wilderness uh, or a new generation has come that's uh, uh, more canny, I don't know. Uh, but I think, you know, just what they offer um, is what people say in Afghanistan is this. First of all, they offer security. Uh, a lot of Afghanistan under the Americans was being run essentially by warlords. And they were often the same warlords that had run the place in, in, in the late 80s and early 90s uh, when the Soviets withdrew. Uh, Ismail Khan of of Herat, for instance, uh, Abdul Rashid Ros uh, Dostam in, in, in Mazar. These are brutal men. Uh, and um, um, Ismail Khan is not very different from the Taliban in his views of women's rights or, or, or that sort of thing. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask you, are we going to be surprised by their misogyny? How bad is it going to be for women there? Uh, again, we have to see. Uh, I think to the extent that this new generation hasn't grown up in those all-male se seminaries. You know, the first generation of Taliban were sociologically distinct. They, they, many of them didn't know any women. There were, a lot of them were orphans, so they didn't know mothers and they, they didn't know have sisters. And they, they were brought up in these uh, all-male schools. Uh, so I think they were the ultimate nerds, you know, they were, uh, very much afraid of, of women's autonomy. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, th this new generation didn't grow up under those circumstances, uh, and, and many of them have families. Uh, we'll have to see if their attitudes will be different. Um, but uh, uh, the other thing is, again, it's very hard for a Western audience to understand this, but uh, the Taliban are seen as holy men. And uh, in, in Afghan society, uh, people have a great deal of loyalty to clan, uh, to, to, we often say, tribe. Uh, and it matters. You know, I had friends who lived uh, in, in, an, uh, in an Arab American community, and their children uh, got into a school, schoolyard fight. And the children came home mad at their mother. They said, you didn't tell us about the cousins. Because when they got into a fight with one kid, all the kid's cousins came and helped him. Uh, and, you know, industrialization and mobilization and those things have broken up a lot of these ties in, in the United States. I often ask my class, you know, how many of you could get a $5,000 car loan if you needed a new car uh, from your first cousin? And I would say maybe 10% of the class raises their hand. And I say, you guys have tribe, the rest of you have no clue. But these tribes, uh, uh, the, the, the kinship networks support each other, but then they're in conflict with other kinship networks. There are feuds going on, Hatfields and McCoys. And you need a, mo a mediator. Who's, who do you trust to come in and settle the feud? Who's going to be really just? You need a holy man. So one of the things that the Taliban 
does for people is that it'll settle their feuds amongst them. They're bringing justice. The leader, their leaders are judges, chief justice. And, and then they will stop the warlords from looting you and from raping your daughter. They will stick a gun in the warlord's face and, and cut, say, cut it out or else. And so people like that. Uh, and I think, you know, and, and what do they have to lose? Uh, the, the poverty rate in Afghanistan in the last five years has soared. Uh, and um, there's a small sliver of society that's raking up all of these development dollars coming in from the United States as strengthening some clans against others, it's heightening the feuds. Taliban promised to end all that. So, you know, at the granular level, down at the village level, there are things that the Taliban, the people hope the Taliban will do for them. Now, whether they follow through or not, I don't know, but this is the hope. I mean, I'm an American. I can't imagine anybody being immune to the blandishments of capitalism, but uh, I, they can't be bought is what they, uh, 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 that's been their reputation, and uh, it is that reputation that makes them attractive to people. Again, whether they get corrupted now that they're in power, I can't tell you. Right. Please continue, Professor Hussein. Well, I just was going to say that that's kind of what they offered in the 1990s during that period of warlord factional strife and war post-Soviets. Um, you know, it was just tearing the country apart and the Taliban managed to impose a ruthless uh, peace, you know, that people appreciated for a brief period of time before they started suffering terribly under this draconian oppressive rule. But, you know, the Afghanistan, the Afghan people, they're exhausted by not just decades of war, now it's generations of, of war. I mean, you know, it's 20 years of this latest uh, conflict that is now coming to an end, uh, but there were two decades of war, you know, that preceded it. So I think people are probably exhausted. Um, it'll be interesting to see, you know, what happens and whether um, well, they have the, peace. It doesn't feel like they're going to that the that it's over. Does it? it doesn't feel like it's over. Well, I mean, they control basically the country now. I think the real question and I wonder what uh, Professor Cole thinks, um, you know, whether some of these warlords might re-emerge, particularly as proxies for, um, you know, other powers nearby, uh, say Iran or, you know, other countries that have a, a stake in particular communities and so on, um, you know, that might uh, fuel a bit of a counterinsurgency uh, against the Taliban uh, government. I mean, that'll be interesting to see. But if they're able to establish, establish a peace, a peace. Um, mm -hmm. it, might it might survive, survive for a while. while. Yeah, I, 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 it's, it's very unpredictable at the moment. Some of the warlords have been captured. So Ismail Khan in Herat is in jail. Uh, and uh, Rashid Dostam, uh, who massacred the Taliban at one point uh, mm. uh, in, in 2002, uh, has fled and his whereabouts are unknown. Uh, he, he had fled when uh, the Taliban the, the first time and went to Turkey. Uh, so uh, this is the second time he's had to flee. Uh, so whether, you know, some of the warlords uh, out in the countryside have managed to escape, um, you know, some of them will negotiate with the Taliban and they'll just say, as I said, you know, the Taliban like those black turbans. So all you have to do is take off your white one and put on a black one and you're Taliban. Uh, and that's, you know, the reverse of what happened in 2001, 2002 when the U.S. backed the Northern Alliance. The Taliban took off their black turbans and put on white ones. Um, but uh, others may foster covert operations and uh, uh, strike at the new government. Uh, and um, I think it, it, it depends a great deal on how, how the Taliban treat people. If, if they're brutal uh, to people, then there will be resistance. Yeah, that's sort of what I had been wondering before, whether they'll moderate, um, you know, if they've learned anything or if the movement has changed, uh, you know, especially with the influx of some of these other groups that were absorbed into the Taliban. As you say, it's a pretty elastic uh, category, so um, it's hard to know. Has the ideological orientation developed or changed at all as a result of 
um, you know, previous history and the absorption of um, new groups of, of people outside of that original seminarian core. Um, I guess there are a lot of questions, so we'll we'll see. I don't know if we have time, David, for other, uh, you know, topics, or if Professor Cole. Do you has want to time. take the Q and A from our audience? Oh wow! There's some Q and A's in the if you if. Yeah, if, I, I can answer a few questions. I, I let's I let's say I, I could stay as much as another fifteen minutes, then I have to go. Great, thank you, Professor Hussein. You want to address the Q and A in the. Sure. I mean, we've got some uh, questions from Joe in Norway um, that have been posted. One of them is, are there any legal threats and travel restrictions the living architects of the global on global war on terror are facing? Any new war crimes lawsuits at the ICC? Uh, that the Taliban are facing. I think he means um, uh, the American, American architects. architects, but we don't. Oh. Yeah, We're well, there is a there is a case the uh, there, there is a bruted case against uh, uh, the U.S. military at the International Criminal Court, uh, and um, um, the Trump administration actually placed Treasury Department sanctions on the ICC judges uh, to attempt to prevent them from going forward with that case. Uh, the Biden administration has backed off that threat. Uh, but I, I don't have details of where the case now is. So we're, we're not only not signatories to the International Criminal Court, we're actually trying to punish the judges. We, we have threatened the judges that they should never come near us or Israel. Right. We're not under international law, apparently. Why do they hate us? What is the next question? <laughs> well, this is a global question from Dan uh, Hagertz. What does Dr. Cole think the role of the West should be in the greater region? Well, um, the thing that I would regret is if the rise of the Taliban government should result in the, the new government and the people of Afghanistan being placed under sanctions. Uh, I think uh, the, the U.S., has gone wild with the sanctions business uh, since the 1990s uh, and uses it uh, instead of diplomacy uh, and in ways that are ruinous to the lives of ordinary people. Uh, and uh, uh, we can see this in Iran. Um, the Secretary of, former Secretary of State uh, Pompeo used to say that the U.S. financial sanctions on Iran and trade sanctions didn't interfere with humanitarian aid. Uh, and this is simply not true. And uh, Madeleine yeah. Albright was okay with the humanitarian disasters created by the sanctions against Iraq. Uh, she, she told me she deeply regrets her phraseology in that regard. Uh, but in any case, yes, I mean, these kinds of sanctions that have knock on, I, I think, the, to be fair, the, the sanctions on Iraq in the 1990s, um, uh, one of them was that since chlorine can be used to make bombs, uh, they stopped chlorine from going into the country. But chlorine is essential to water purification. Uh, and I don't know about you, but I really wouldn't want, want to drink the Tigris after it flowed by Baghdad without having the water purified. Uh, and uh, so adults can survive uh, uh, those, my, uh, those bacteria, but uh, babies don't do well. Uh, they don't have immunity. So uh, there, there was a, a spike in, in infant mortality uh, from us not letting the chlor chlorine and on the grounds that it had it was dual use, it had military uses. That was, I think, not foreseen uh, and, and, and was genuinely regretted. Uh, the UN and other studies of the 90s have now suggested that maybe s some of the uh, fatality statistics were exaggerated. But anyway, you, you make my point, uh, um, uh, David, that the uh, the U.S. has for a long time now engaged in sanctions that have a deleterious effect on ordinary everyday people, not just on the governments that are being targeted. Uh, and in Iran, the Trump administration actually uh, made the Iranian Central Bank a terrorist organization 
So you can't send money to Iran if you're an aid organization without being charged with material support of terrorism. Uh, and uh, it's, it's interfered with them getting the vaccine. I think the Biden administration is trying to take off that sanction. But uh, I, I would hate to see the poor Afghan people now again punished by the international community uh, just because the Taliban came to power. I, I think, in fact, if we're hoping that the Taliban will moderate, uh, the best thing would be for the country to be able to develop and, and have some prosperity. Uh, I think most prosperous people don't want to live hyper Puritan lives. Uh, and uh, um, so anyway, and, and, any, and since they are very poor and they've been under war all this time and many are refugees, uh, it, it just would be horrible for us to sanction the whole country. Yeah, I mean, that reminds me that I think Germany announced that um, they would be ending their aid operations um, as a result of the Taliban takeover. And that's exactly the kind of counterproductive, you know, even if you don't have sanctions, if nobody is willing to make any investments to help the people who have been suffering so much, uh, it certainly will worsen worsen the situation. Um, uh, Professor Marianne Cummings um, may be getting at something from a different angle that I was asking about. What was the effect on the character and conduct of the Taliban by their association with Al-Qaeda? Have they changed post-Al-Qaeda? So I guess that's getting at like whether the Taliban have developed ideologically in any different sort of direction, perhaps. Yeah, I, I think it's a mixed picture. Um, I think... Uh, there are some, uh, well, well there, were, there were a lot of Taliban who were furious with bin Laden for 9-11 because he brought the whole weight of the U.S. military down on them and cost them the rule of the country. Uh, and, and they maintain he didn't tell them that while he was their guest, he was planning to hit a superpower from their territory. Uh, so, and by the way, there were a lot of Al-Qaeda operatives who were upset with bin Laden over it as well. He put a big red uh, target on their backs. Uh, so um, it could be uh, that uh, the, the current leadership will be un, unwilling uh, to put up with uh, uh, hosting active terrorist cells. Uh, and they are, by the way, the Taliban are America's best friend in fighting ISIL. If what you're worried of is about the so-called Islamic State and its uh, plans for caliphate, uh, they do have a, a branch in Afghanistan. It is small, uh, but the Taliban are brutal towards it. Uh, they, they they have fought it uh, uh, effectively. Uh, so there could be counterterrorism, you know, positive implications of uh, of Taliban rule. But there are Taliban who are old buddies with some of those Al Qaeda guys, uh, and uh, uh, who will bring them back and pal around with them. Uh, we should we should have our eyes open about that. Maybe uh, last question uh, here uh, again from Joe in Norway, and uh, I'm glad that we have listener questions because I wanted to ask about some of these other topics that we didn't get a chance to discuss, but. Uh, Joe in Norway writes, news from East Jerusalem has been quite, uh, I guess, present in the Western media. What has the new Israeli administration been doing about the ethnic cleansing going on there? Well, the new Israeli government is itself uh, extremely divided, uh, and uh, it uh, is headed by Naftali Bennett, who is more dedicated to the settler cause uh, of, of Israelis uh, uh, squatting on Palestinian territory uh, than his predecessor was. Uh, and uh, Bennett seems to be getting his way in the cabinet. Uh, and so more squatter settlements have been announced by Israelis uh, in the Palestinian West Bank. And um, more Palestinian families have been expelled uh, from their homes uh, to which they got title typically uh, during that period when Jordan was uh, ruling the West Bank uh, uh, before 1967 and whose title would stand up in international law. Uh, but the Israelis have uh, 
abrogated the, those titles and they're expelling Palestinians from the neighborhoods of Silwan and uh, Sheikh Jarrah. Uh, ultimately, some tens of thousands of Palestinians are in danger of being made homeless in this way. Uh, some of them for a vanity project uh, that Israelis uh, dream of, of a vast uh, uh, kind of museum of the city of David. Uh, and um, some of them uh, so that Israeli squatter settlers can come over from Tel Aviv and kick Palestinians out of their homes and, 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 and dwell in them. Uh, that situation is unfolding. Uh, more uh, people were kicked out of their homes uh, this past week uh, in Sheikh Jarrah and uh, uh, maybe it was Salwan, I can't remember. And, and then uh, there's no sign of the Bennett government backing off of this policy. Um, if uh, listeners would like to learn more about Afghanistan and its, its history and the situation, do you have any recommendations for reading besides, of course, people regularly following uh, analysis uh, in uh, informed comment? Where else should they go uh, to learn more about Afghanistan? Well, there's a great book by Thomas Barfield of uh, 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 Boston University, a uh, real old time, old, old Afghan hand. Uh, and uh, there is a series of books uh, by Edward Williams, uh, uh, which are excellent. Uh, so um, the, there are anthropologists, uh, mainly anthropologists, who have uh, written really spectacular works about Afghanistan. I always tell people when they ask me for recommendations for reading on a subject uh, that um, um, look to see whether where the person teaches. Uh, if you can't answer that question, then don't bother. Uh, of course, there are also some good journalists. I, I shouldn't be too glib. Uh, um, no, you're, you're, absolutely, you're absolutely right, especially now with all this mm -hmm. disinformation. That's a great question to ask. Yeah. Rashid Ahmad uh, is another uh, a great uh, Afghanistan expert who has a number of books uh, on the Taliban. In particular, he's a journalist uh, based in yes. Pakistan, uh, but uh, but a journalist of very high uh, standards and with academic type expertise. And I want to thank you for informed comment because you're you write for people like me. You you don't try to you you try to explain things in in a simple language. It's accessible. Uh, I I don't want to bring up Paul Krugman, but he writes about economics in a way for the simple-minded and i find uh you're a great uh a writer and i thank you for making uh, such complicated such complicated issues uh somewhat digestible so th thank you for informed comment uh, well, well, thank you, David. That means a lot to me coming from you and coming from I, a simpleton. I know. Oh, no, I mean. no. From a journalist <laughs> yourself. I, well, I, I actually worked for, for a newspaper in Beirut. Uh, and uh, uh, I also did some student journalism. So I, I kind of got we used to say in the old days, that you get ink in your blood. I guess that doesn't work anymore. Uh, yeah. But uh, uh, academic remember, writing tends to push people away yeah. and a professor who has some journalism in his blood it's more inclusive it, it's you important. have to, to try to you can't be writerly you have to be readerly you have to try right. to think about the reader I, I once used the word lacrimose which means tearful in one of my stories my editor came to me and said Cole that's a 25 cent word <laughs> You give me a five cent word and I'll give you 20 cents change. <laughs> <laughs> Thank That's you. excellent. Well, you've been really generous with your time again, uh, Juan. We really appreciate it. And um, I think listeners have a really good handle now on what's been going on in Afghanistan and, and beyond. So thanks so much for, for Thank coming you. to talk with us. Well, thank you. It's, it's always a good stop for me. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Adnan Hussein, for bringing Dr. Cole back. And please, everybody go to informed comment, wancole.com. I promise you, you will, uh, you'll, 
you'll thank me for that. Thank you, uh, Dr. Cole, and thank you, uh, Professor Adnan Hussein.